appreciate you. And if you're new here and you enjoy Whispered True Crime, please consider subscribing to the channel. I post
family. She had been born without hearing, and she used hearing aids. She attended Washington University in St. Louis, where she got her doctorate in audiology. After she got her doctorate, she found a job, a good job as an audiologist at UCLA. And so she moved to California, and that was in 2017. And according to Bryn's patients, she was dedicated and wanted to help people. They all spoke very highly of her. Now she also had a service dog who was a Siberian Husky, and she named the dog Arya. I believe that's a reference to Game of Thrones, but I didn't hear that anywhere. That's just coming from me. And she loved this dog. She took Arya everywhere she went, obviously, because Arya was a service dog, so that is how it works. So after the two met at the dog park, Bryn and Chad began dating casually. Now, on May 27th, 2018, they had been dating for less than a month, and Bryn went over to Chad's condo that evening, and his two roommates were home, but they had gone into their respective bedrooms and had gone to sleep, and Chad and Bryn started out the evening watching TV. And then Chad brought out his bong, and the two of them took a hit from it. Now she, Bryn, was not a regular user at all. In fact, she had only used it once or twice in her life, and this is confirmed by her friends and family later on. So when she used it, I mean, she didn't, she wasn't, uh, knowledgeable about how to do it, you know, what to do exactly, I guess, you know. So anyway, after the hit, she said she didn't feel anything. So, according to her, all of this is according to her, actually, um, Chad got out of some different kind of, um, marijuana, put it in his bong, and he told her to try that. And she said that she didn't really want to, but he was pressuring her. So she, and he also was like telling her exactly how to do it. Like, this is how you inhale it, do this, you know. So after she took that second hit, almost instantly, she started to feel really bad. She was dizzy. She felt like she was gonna vomit. Her vision became blurred. She felt like she couldn't breathe. And she told Chad he was trying to calm her down. He got her some water. And she was starting to feel very paranoid. And she asked Chad to watch her that night when she went to sleep to make sure nothing happened. And he said he would, but it didn't get to that point because she started to hear voices in her head and she started to hallucinate. She believed that she was dead and it was Chad's fault because he gave her the marijuana. And the voices told her that the only way that she could come back to life was by killing Chad. So she went over into the kitchen and she grabbed a knife. It was an eight inch serrated knife. And she started stabbing Chad repeatedly. And he was trying to fight back, but she would not stop. And she, the furniture was flying everywhere. You know, things were falling, things were breaking. It was a chaotic and crazy scene. And the more 
she stabbed, the more she felt like she was coming back to life. That's why she kept stabbing more and more and more to bring herself back to life. And one of the roommates finally heard the commotion. You know, he heard a little bit at first, but didn't think much of it. But then he started to realize, you know, something is going on. Now the other roommate slept with um, earplugs, so he didn't hear a thing. So it was Vinny who came downstairs and he saw the scene. He saw the furniture everywhere. He saw Chad covered in blood. And he saw Bryn standing there holding the knife, looking very odd, very scary, like staring at him like he was next. And Chad screamed out to him to get out of there and call 911. Like he wasn't asking Vinny to help because Vinny would have gotten stabbed as well. He just wanted him to get out of there and call for help and that is what he did. He ran out. He called the police. The police came immediately and when they got there, they saw that Bryn was still standing over Chad's now lifeless body, stabbing him. She was still stabbing him. And they screamed at her to stop and drop the knife. At that point, the voices told her it was time to hurt herself. So she started stabbing herself in the neck. So the police tased her to get her to stop. But it was like she couldn't feel a thing. She didn't even react to the tasing. They tased her a second time. Just kept screaming at her to drop the knife and she was screaming and cursing back at them, but she didn't. She didn't drop it. She kept stabbing at herself. So they took out their batons and started hitting her, like hitting her in the arms, trying to get her to drop the knife. They had to hit her nine times, which ultimately resulted in breaking her wrist, I think, but she dropped the knife finally. And unfortunately, Chad did not survive this attack. Bryn was brought to the hospital because she needed surgery for the self-inflicted wounds to her throat. And trigger warning, I'm about to say something having to do with animal abuse, so skip ahead about a minute. So, she also wound up attacking her own dog, Aria, her dog who she loved. She attacked her dog with a knife, and a neighbor saw the dog being carried out in a blanket, but I'm happy to say her dog survived, okay? The dog got treatment immediately. And she survived. Okay, so, meanwhile, the autopsy showed that Chad had been stabbed a total of 108 times. He had defensive wounds on his hands from trying to get the knife away. Two of the stabs had perforated his heart. And there were obviously stabs all over him of varying degrees of depth and size. When Bryn was at the hospital, they did a blood test to see what she had in her system. And the only thing they found was THC, which you know is from the marijuana. They didn't find anything else, not another thing. But trying to test the strength of it or how much she had was difficult because she didn't just take it like it was already, you know, working its way through her system. So they, they couldn't possibly get an accurate idea of the strength. Now, as soon as she was well enough to communicate and her breathing tube had 
She told the police that Chad had forced her to use the marijuana, and she was extremely confused about everything. She didn't know where she was at that time. She asked where was Chad. She, she couldn't tell them very much. But as soon as she was cleared to leave the hospital, which was four days after going in, and it was May 31st, 2018, she was arrested and she was charged with Chad's murder. By this time, she was not as confused as she had been. She was able to tell them the events of the evening, which were exactly what I already told you, you know, when I explained what happened that night. So she was able to get out on $510,000 bail, and she awaited her trial at home, leading her life, but she had been fired from her job, and she lost her license as an audiologist. It took five years for this case to eventually go to trial, and that was because of COVID, and the fact that since she was hearing impaired, they couldn't do uh, a trial where people were wearing masks because she reads lips, so they had to wait until nobody would need masks, so that's why it took a very long time. In September of 2023, the case was going to go to trial soon, but it hadn't yet. There was a new DA who took office, and they took a look at this case, and they changed the charge from murder to involuntary manslaughter. And that was because a mental health expert had diagnosed Bryn with cannabis-induced psychosis, meaning that having used the cannabis made her psychotic and everything that she did was beyond her control. So it wasn't as if it was a planned murder or that she intended on killing him, but it was involuntary manslaughter. So the charge was changed and Chad's family was very upset with that to begin with. They were very vocal, especially his father, Sean. He was very vocal about this case, as I'll talk a little bit later. Bryn pled not guilty to the new charge as well. And the trial began in November of 2023. Both sides agreed that she had this induced psychosis, so nobody was arguing that. The issue was, had she chosen to get high, or had she not foreseen the consequences of what could have happened? She did not go into this wanting to get totally high out of her mind. She had no idea that anything like this would happen, okay? The prosecution tried to paint a picture of Bryn as a narcissistic party girl who just wanted to go over there that night and get totally intoxicated, which had ultimately resulted in Chad's death. The defense portrayed her in the opposite way, saying she was an honest, responsible, non-violent, professional woman who didn't party or do drugs at all in her normal life. Her friends confirmed this. It was said by the defense that she had been curious that night about the drug, so she tried it. And when nothing happened, she didn't really want to try something else. But Chad had pressured her. He had intimidated her. Not in a way that she, you know, thought he was going to hurt her, but just she, like, 
she had that feeling like she had to do it, you know, to make him happy. But she had no way of knowing that she could ever possibly have a psychotic reaction. This was not even on her radar in any way whatsoever. Now, a week before the murder, it was found and presented in court that Chad had ordered some cannabis from an unlicensed online dispensary. It was a high strength strain called OG Kush, which contained 31% THC, which is a lot if you don't know. I don't know these things, but it's a lot. It's very strong. And this product was meant to be used by people who have high tolerances, people like Chad, regular users. And it's believed that this is the product that he had given her on the second hit. Now, studies have shown that using high potency cannabis with a THC percentage above 10, so this one I said was 30, right? 31%. So, when THC percentage is above 10%, it can at least double the risk of psychosis. Now, I mentioned earlier that the blood tests could not indicate the exact strength of THC that she had in her body, or the amount or anything, but expert witnesses estimated the strength to be between 12 and 16 percent. The case was concluded in December of 2023, and it took four hours for the jury to come back with a decision. They had found her guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Her sentencing was in January of 2024, and she was handed a suspended prison sentence of four years, meaning she doesn't have to actually go to prison. She was given two years probation, and if she violates the probation, then she will have to go and serve the four years in prison. She will also need to complete 100 hours of community service, focusing on raising awareness about the effects of marijuana-induced psychosis. At the sentencing, Bryn cried and she spoke to Chad's family, saying, quote, My actions have ripped your family apart. I am broken and aching inside. I hurt that you will never see Chad again, end quote. After hearing the sentence, Chad's father, Sean, stated, quote, he just gave everyone in the state of California who smokes marijuana a license to kill someone, end quote. Chad's mother, Michelle, who suffered from type 2 diabetes, became very depressed after the death of her son, and she stopped taking care of herself, stopped taking her medications properly. And just 18 months after Chad's death, she suffered a major heart dysfunction and died. According to her ex-husband, Sean, quote, After the funeral, she became very depressed. When you lose a child, you think, am I ever allowed to be happy again? There's this guilt. She wouldn't let anyone take a picture of her smiling, and this led to her decline, end quote. And that is the case. What are your thoughts? I will share some of mine. First of all, rest in peace to Chad. He did not deserve what happened to him in any way, shape, or form. He sounds like he was a great person and was loved by so many. His life has been cut short in such a tragic way. I hate to even imagine the pain and horror he must have felt on that night, the night of the murder. My heart also goes out to his family, who are heartbroken not only due to his murder, but also due to their feeling that justice has not been served. Now, 
alive and you kill someone, that is your fault. Okay? Even though you were out of your mind because you were drunk, the thing is, before you drank, you knew what was going to happen. You knew you were going to get drunk. You knew you brought your car. You knew you were going to drive it home. So you are responsible. Okay? Now, with Bryn, she was using a legal substance. So there's no crime there. She had no idea it could make her psychotic or make her lose control of her thoughts and actions. She didn't use the drug and then go out and drive a car. I assume she would have known that that could have led to tragic consequences, but staying at home with her date and smoking some of the marijuana that he gave her, which I'm sure she assumed was safe. Regular marijuana. She couldn't have foreseen that anything like this would have happened. So what is she responsible for? What did she do? What did she do wrong? What did she do differently than anyone else who has a little bit of marijuana with their boyfriend? It's just extremely, extremely unfortunate and tragic that she had this horrible reaction to it. And the issue of whether or not he forced her, I mean... She said it wasn't a physical thing, he didn't physically force her, but she felt like she needed to do it. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean very much. He could have just said, well, come on, give this one a try, come on, you know, like, like something as innocent as that. But regardless, she had no idea that this could possibly happen, and neither did he. Nobody knew. So what is the crime? Well, she murdered him in a very, very gruesome and bloody way, for sure. But she wasn't in her right mind at all. She was psychotic. So, if they would have sent her to prison, what would be the point? Would... Would you say that she is a danger to society? That if you let her out on the street, she's gonna go and stab more people? No, no, that is not gonna happen. I am pretty sure she will never, ever, ever touch marijuana ever again. Now, does she need to be punished to learn a lesson? I have to say, I, I think she learned the lesson. I'm pretty sure there was a huge lesson learned here. She knows not to do it again. So the only thing is, should she be put in prison so that it will send a message to other people that if you kill someone when you use marijuana, you will go to prison? Is that the message that she needs to give out? Is she the person who needs to go to prison to get out that message? I don't really think that's fair, to be honest. So, in my opinion, now, I know this is going to be, uh, there's going to be people on both sides and people will feel very strongly. I feel that there is no need for her to go to prison. Her life is ruined anyway. She lost her license. She lost her livelihood. She has to live with this horrific guilt. Granted, her losses pale in comparison to Chad's losses. He lost his life and the losses of his family. But nonetheless, her life is basically ruined, although she is alive. And she can try to turn things around. But I have to say, I completely empathize with Chad's family. I understand why they are reacting the way that they are. And I have to be honest, I very possibly would react that way as well. They need someone to blame. They need her to be held accountable for what happened to their son. And they don't think it's fair 
chat is gone. I totally get how they feel. But since luckily I'm not in their shoes, I'm able to see it a little bit more clearly. And I just, I don't see the reason for her to go to prison. And I don't believe that this case gave a permission for everyone out there who uses cannabis to kill people. That's not the case. So, anyway, I am going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found it to be thought-provoking. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. And I hope you have a wonderful day or night, wherever.